So, Susan, you have worked with some incredible young people. I'd love you to tell us some examples of the digital literacy projects that you've seen them come up with, some of the things you've come across that promote or create digital well-being. Oh, thank you, Edie. Um, I have this amazing uh, job. I get to work with Gen Z. So I'm working with the Isabellas and the Gitanjali's out there. So that's really, that's really my vantage point that I come from. You're going to hear from a lot of adults, and there's phenomenal programs out there that are working. Jim Steyer just talked about Common Sense Media. But the one thing that I realized is we weren't turning to Gen Z and saying, what are your pain points? What are your experiences? And even more importantly, what are your solutions? which you've heard. So that's what, that's what we do. Um, and, and hold competitions for students to come together that everybody here can do in your own communities. And they come together and they tell us, they say we need privacy laws that include our vantage point. We need to know. Tell us, we want to tell you what kind of social media we want. We don't want it to be addictive. We don't want to be controlled by the algorithms. And then youth, we have a Youth for Youth Summit. And think of this, think of it, this conference right here was all youth coming up and speaking on these very issues. They know these things, they have these ideas. And so the literacy that they have from the adults, from the parents, from the schools, they then can turn around and do peer to peer um, and use storytelling. So they know how to use social media. They know the promise and peril of it. But what they also do is they tell stories to each other. And if they don't listen to their parents or if they don't listen to their teachers, they really do listen to their peers. It's fantastic. So then I'll tell us about some of the examples of digital literacy programs that you have seen within your Latinx community. Great. Um, so with HACLAC, we're mainly concerned with um, kind of balancing the digital divide. Um, so far, strategies have been focused on creating access, deploying computers, cell phones, creating all the, the, the digital ecosystem that entails this um, digital era that we're living. But that was not parallel with strategies on digital education. So digital education so far has been um, uneven within these last 20 years of progressing into the internet permeating in, into different dimensions of our lives. Um, and it's been based mostly on using digital technologies and not so much on understanding how this work um, and critically engaging with these technologies. With HackLack, we're trying to uh, bring the understanding of how digital technologies work outside the science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines uh, that generally portray technology as neutral, understand how um, these technologies affect us um, politically, economically, socially, psychologically, and our environment as well, in order not only to um, understand and have the values and the skills, but also to actively participate as change makers, uh, as tech developers, as uh, active participants in the development of the digital policies that we need and we want. And those we co-create with youth, with children, with educators, with activists, academics, and technologies in order to then advocate for these to be included, uh, formally included in, in schools and also for adult education as well. Because it's not only putting the onus on, on the younger generations as what we're, where we're failing as, um, as developers, as policymakers, um, as researchers as well to the younger, gener gen so younger generations. So a real connection in terms of getting the co-creation coming from the people who are affected the most. Fascinating. Tell me, Bailey, you mentioned your five-step plan. You skipped from one to five. But tell me, what kind of digital literacy examples would you point to that really work? Well, if you continue on the definition of literacy as to know, to have knowledge and competence in a certain area, then really we all work in digital literacy here because we're all spreading some kind of knowledge here today and tomorrow. I'd say one of the things that's, uh, that always gets folks, especially young people, we do a lot of literacy, knowing work around uh, social media addiction. And what does this look like? And we actually, when I built this assessment, I built it through the lens of how we present signs of addiction to other risky behaviors and through the lens of social media. And so some of the knowledge work we would do is through going the assessment, going 
after going through the assessment, you simultaneously learn some of the signs of addiction. So for example, have you ever blacked out on social media and not remember what you did for the last hour? How, to what degree does this happen to you? This happens a lot, there might be an issue. Does this happen in tandem with, have you ever lied or manipulated a situation to go use social media. For example, you told your friends you're going to the bathroom, but you actually just wanted to check something. Have you ever put yourself in physical danger? Like maybe you were trying to cross a road and someone honked at you because you were using social media. To what degree does this happen? So we do a lot of literacy uh, there just because um, you know, without the requisite knowledge, this seems to be happening more and more often. An addiction, but not necessarily calling it an addiction because it's so ubiquitous. But if you ask me, by every measure right now, there is mass addiction to social media. Can we just ask the, a few of those questions to the people in the audience? Just repeat some of those <laughs> we questions. <can> definitely. <laughs> I'm an educator by training, so I would love to do crowd work. Um, how, well, let's see. I don't know if people are going to self-admit to these ones, so there's going to be a public bias. <laughs> so uh, how many of you have not remembered what you've been doing on social media after you got off? If I asked you the kinds of posts, you wouldn't have be able to answer it. OK, a few hands there coming up slowly. Yep. Now, this assessment would say, how often does that happen to you? Um, how many of you have, another one, thought about what you're going to post or how you're going to respond to something while you're in another situation. You're off social media, but you're thinking about what you're going to do on social media. OK, a few more hands coming up. Yep. To what degree does this happen to you? So it would be similar if, if we were talking with, um, let's say, and actually we did, if you were talking with an alcoholic, you would actually see very similar tendencies. I think about it when I'm not doing it. It has maybe harmed my relationships. It has maybe put me in dangerous physical situations before. I have maybe blacked out doing it. And to what degree does this happen? Interesting. Getting me all riled up. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, let me bring you in here, because I, I want to hear more about some of the projects the, that the youth that you've worked with have, have come up with. You also mentioned some of the laws that they want to see from regulators. Tell us more. So it's really interesting. If you go to technicallypolitics.org, you will find two dynamic uh, uh, college students who are collecting stories from their peers, um, but in this asking about their experiences on social media with the express uh, focus of bringing it to legislators. So I live in California uh, and I'm very excited that there is a new bill coming up, the Age Appropriate Design Code, and the California legislatures are actually asking for the youth advocates to come um, and present. And really, it's very powerful when they do this. So that's, that's one of the ways, and they're asking, they're asking for something very simple. Turning to the tech companies and saying, can you prioritize well-being over profits? So we know this is a really difficult thing, um, but the thing that's really exciting is since Francis Haugen spoke, um, and with the Facebook files, there is legislation coming up and it's possible. We have this feeling that it's possible. Part of it is that the UK has passed a design code and so there's a folding over. So having a global summit like this and then bringing global youth to the conversations that we can start to fold on each other's laws. So. That's, that's really exciting. But more and more and more organizations that I work with, advocacy organizations, they're asking for the youth. They want a youth council. They want youth advisors. So really, you know, we haven't seen the power of Gen Z yet um, and, then, and then the generation below, but I'm really optimistic about Sounds it. Sounds like you could provide them with some of these youth advisors. I absolutely <laughs> could. <laughs> So then what about you? Lawmakers need to be digitally literate as well. Uh, what would you, what regulation or laws that the, the youth that you know work with, what do they want to see? Definitely um, including critical digital education, for example, in, in curriculum, but also having spaces for informal education, programs that promote that, that sustain that economically, and uh, policies that are also informed by research, and research not only created in Europe or in North America. For example, the report that was presented by Zinc, I think it's uh, really important to have what's this time, uh, standpoint 
of, um, um, of Saudi Arabia on this problem. We're all engaging into the, in this conversation and also need to understand and make sense of what is the truth about well-being, what is well-being understood in different cultures and different generations as well. So policy is also informed by research created um, in different regions, different cultures, um, and making uh, spaces for meaningful participation. Um, and in relation to youth, as Susan was saying, um, spaces for them to have their own places to lead, but they think they are the future. We need to engage them more. Um, they are in, in many regions they're not voting or associating with uh, political parties or in unions as in with other generations but they're gravitating into digital spaces to advocate for their cultural rights to the environment gender rights also um so we need to find ways to also attract them and into our insti democratic institutions or into this global discussion as well and that those spaces need to be intergenerational um to also bring together the knowledge from the past and think to collectively and make sense of what's the future that, that we it's want. It's interesting that the that the young people you work with are are asking for this uh, for legislation to encourage the literacy, uh, even though they're the digital natives. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, tell us, Bailey, about from your perspective about how legislators can help promote digital literacy. What do you? Yeah, well, I think that Soledad said something really important there, which is that well-being is defined differently around the world. And, um, and you know, how we regulate other risky behaviors and how we regulate other communications media is usually done on the national level. And so it, this, too, should be done, I think, on the national level. And what that's going to require, for example, like in, in Canada, um, certainly other countries around the world, there are certain things that you're not allowed to advertise on kids' television. Okay, this is not surprising. You're not allowed to advertise cigarettes, for example. And uh, this is regulated by the government and um, enforced and put into action by the broadcasters. The broadcasters are required to adhere to this. So we have risky behaviors paired with communications media. Those same advertisers went over to Facebook, Instagram, and targeted young 14-year-olds with, with pharmaceuticals and vaping. They did it, and it worked, and we had a vaping crisis in the US. And so this is, this is politics, and if you ask me, what they need is a little bit more courage to go, to go after some of the businesses, I even hate saying it that way, to work together with some of these businesses to regulate in a, in a national way. And I really think UK has, has led the charge on this because what they've done is, it seems so simple, but it's actually such a difference in the internet world, which is they're saying, we are regulating based on where the service is being delivered not where it's coming from. It's dramatically different in internet regulation. They're saying, you know, Facebook, Google, you name it, we don't really care where you're based. Say it's in Dublin, it's actually in California. But um, if you are servicing people here in Saudi, if you are servicing people here in the UK or Canada, you figure it out. These are the rules. You figured it out in every other risky behavior, and we require distributors of other risky behaviors to educate about their warnings, like putting warnings on a smoke pack. Why is there no knowledge or practical test before you get into this risky behavior that is up to upwards of, what, eight hours a day? So do you think there should be a test before you hand a child a phone? <laughs> There's got to be some tests, but like every risky behavior, it's a multi-pronged approach that's going to be required. So say like I, I gave the example of driving there, but that is a good example of one where the governments came together, parents teach about driving, educators, there's literally whole driving schools, and then we have this license, and then we have rules, and what we're ultimately trying to do is keep the society safe and well. So what I wanted to you know, get into t today or tomorrow or, or you know, with uh, fellow delegates and, and speakers is just this, actually. Should there be a license? What does that license look like? Um, why are we not having this conversation and putting out, or together at least, having this conversation together? That's the truth. Because we were just talking about how it is happening in different parts of the world, but how we've just not connected yet. So this is really important. Or should there be a license to develop the technology also? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then, much is that national too? You know, right. maybe that's Responsibility on us. Because maybe Canada would say, we think this age is good. And maybe right. Italy would say, we think this age is good. Right. What, like you, what do you think, Susan? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, the puzzle is you have the law, you have the license, but then how do you enforce it? Um, and so that's, that's where the buy-in comes in. 
um, from, from those users um, or those that have the license, so the youth so themselves. Something interesting would be also in Canada, if you are distributing alcohol, which would be a risky behavior, you is actually on the bars distributing the alcohol to right. enforce the laws that are in place. And they get in trouble if someone gets drunk and goes and drives right. home and kills someone. Right. So, if we maybe use this as a, at least a model to start the conversation, because, you know, maybe it is partially on the companies. And I think Isabel from earlier today would be one of those people, um, you know, kind of right. like working in this space yeah. of what can these companies do. What I'm interested in is tomorrow's conversation on tech, or later today or tomorrow, about tech as a, as a human right. Yeah, later. And that, actually, I think that would be the, the, and the so counterbalance. A, that's a question I wanted to ask you, because are we missing a trick? Because we have the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's been around for many years. Could we use that to promote digital literacy, digital well-being? Yeah, so the discussion particularly, uh, there was a report in 2015 showcasing that one in three um, internet uh, users online globally were un under 18 years old and how so far discussions on the internet governance were not engaging into this and how we can develop digital spaces that balance protecting children but also enabling their participation and uh, developing those spaces according to their um, needs and wants. Right. Um, and it's quite comprehensive and it's um, one of the most widely ratified treaties and it can, it's really helpful to um, assess in which areas we're failing and how we can push forward. Interesting. So Susan, tell me, what's one thing that everyone here in person and also those watching online can do right now to increase their digital literacy, their digital well-being? So we, we've done the lookup challenge, and part of it was to choose a time and a space that you're not going to use your phone. So it's the three S's. Can you sleep without your phone or device? Can you study or work without your phone or device? And can you socialize without your phone or device? So that's not a complete social media or phone detox, but it's choosing when when you use it. And students who have done this challenge in week-long challenges, the things they say, and one little boy said, my mom didn't have to wake me up in the morning because I didn't stay up all night playing video games on my phone. So it works. Wow. All right, so what, from your perspective, what's one thing that people can go out right now to increase their digital well-being or their digital literacy? Let's talk more about these issues. Um, others, um, the pandemic accelerated the discussion on, on well-being. Um, and it's important to talk, it's important to think collectively what we want and to engage with the different actors. Um, and the different, different actors are international. So this is uh, a conversation that I want to encourage everyone to be actively uh, participating in and connecting with t big tech or technology, uh, big tech companies or trying to think which technological development you would like to develop or for which policy you would like to advocate, um, do workshops, do campaign, think, think creatively, use these kind of spaces, connect with key stakeholders. Ethra is opening the door, for example, and bringing people together from different parts of the world. Use this platform to uh, actively um, own the, the changes that you want. Yeah. yeah, Bailey, what about you? What's one thing the audience can walk out and do right now? Well, I think you can practice safe social, but step four in practicing safe social is uh, modeling good behavior or leading by example. And sometimes we think just about, um, you know, am I making my, safe so my social media space safe for me or something that actually serves me when I leave it? But I also mean, what are you putting online? And are you contributing to this being a safe and healthy space for others? And not just what you are actually saying on the platforms, but also how do you model your relationship with, you know, say mobile technology? Because whether you like it or not, this is also a learned behavior. So if you have kids, they don't know if you're on email, for example. Like you might be on email doing something to help them, but they don't know. So what they learn is the behavior of pulling this out at the dinner table. So modeling good behavior, leading by example, is thinking about that as well. And then when this policy does come out, go vote on it. Tell people about it and use your platform for this good as well. So practice safe social. 
Fantastic. Well, that is fantastic advice because we are going to go practice safe social and model good behavior <laughs> and use one of the S's right now because we're breaking for a coffee. And for anyone who's here in person, we're meeting in the no tech zone. <laughs> Why is it called that? Well, it's we're, we're here because we're all working on digital well-being. So let's be there IRL. And if you haven't done Bailey's five steps, that stands for in real life. I'm sure everyone here knew that. When we come back, we're going to be looking at the psychology of technology and building on Bailey's point about risky behavior, how engaging with technology can lead to behavior that's hard to get out of. Digital addiction, problematic social media use. We've got some renowned experts on behavioral science for you with the renowned Bureau Chief of Euronews Dubai, Jane Witherspoon. So we'll see you back here at 12 o'clock sharp. Thank you. <laughs>